Thank you everyone for coming. I know it's the first talk of the day, so I'm surprised anyone came, especially for a talk about insects, so I really appreciate that. Um, and it's Data Visual Visualization Week at Columbia. And so, being the first talk of the day, I'm going to discuss a branch of biology where, uh, that deals with single data points or small collections of data points. And often, these data points are, represent the most amount of data you can get. And so, the name of the game is to try and really do justice to these single data points. Um, and this branch of biology is collections-based research. So, in museums around the world, there are hundreds of millions of specimens of all kinds of organisms and uh, minerals and different uh, 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 objects from the natural world. And they've all been given names. And it's this process of naming these objects, this t t taxonomy, which uh, forms the foundation, at least in biological sciences, for uh, 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 many other uh, uh, sub-disciplines within this field. And so finding these uh, organisms in nature, collecting them, giving them names, putting them in these museums, which are then repositories for uh, 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 bio object, biological objects is extremely important and often in, in biology all you can find is a single member of a, a species um, or a, just a, a, a few representatives of that species and so for that species to become something that has a, a genuine value in biology you have to describe it, you have to name it, you have to put a label on it, a holotype label, you have to store it in a museum and make that information available to, to other people, usually in the form of a publication. Okay, so what I'm gonna to discuss today is how uh, the role of imaging in this process of taxonomy and species description and, and the e expansion of biological knowledge over the past two to 300 years. Okay, so there are about 1.7 million described species of organisms. So these are organisms that people have found, collected, named, described, put into museums. And uh, this represents, depends who you ask really, maybe between 50% and perhaps 10% of the total number of organisms there are on Earth. And most uh, organisms, one in every four living things, is about 400,000 species of them, are beetles, which are my favorite group of organisms. Now, to get to 400,000 species for the past 250 years or so, people have been collecting these things throughout the world and doing exactly what I've just told you, putting pins through them, uh, giving them names, writing species descriptions, sometimes doing an illustration or a photograph of them, putting them in, into museums. And that description and the uh, information about where these things are deposited is of use to entomologists throughout the world. And this... Uh, 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 branch of biology that does this is called taxonomy. It's the naming and describing of new species, new genera, and new higher taxa, so things like families and orders and phyla. Okay, and it's not just stamp collecting. Taxonomy forms the basis of all uh, biology because it's only through describing species that you can partition up the natural world into these distinct living entities. Uh, and this uh, is really the kind of foundation for all of these other uh, um, uh, fields. So for example, in evolutionary biology, if we didn't know where species boundaries lie, we wouldn't be able to explore the evolutionary relationships between species. We wouldn't be able to uh, build phylogenetic evolutionary trees to see how these species have evolved and how they're related to each other. We wouldn't understand the process of speciation, whereby one species splits into two. And we wouldn't really understand what we, the, the fossil record and the evolutionary history of life on Earth. Likewise, taxonomy forms the basis for ecology. It's only through knowing what species are out there that we can study the interactions of, of, the, of these different uh, populations and communities that form ecosystems. And of course, organismal biology, anatomy, embryology, neurobiology, behavior, we have to know what species we're dealing with to really uh, make comparisons between species. And of course, all of these disciplines are related to each other in this rich, field of biology where, we under, where the goal is to understand the evolution and functions of different uh, organisms and the, and the uh, 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 structures which uh, uh, 
uh, uh, components of them. And of course, in this day and age where we're just destroying the environment uh, rampantly, taxonomy and collections-based research and the accumulation of specimens in museums has an additional important role in documenting all of this life on Earth before it goes extinct. So many specimens in museums now probably represent species which are no longer found in nature. So taxonomy defines the organisms in the natural world that are living now and organisms which have lived in the past. Okay, so you can't just go out, find what you think is a new species, give it a name it after your mother, and then say, oh, this is my new species named after my mum. There are specific rules involved in describing a new, new species and making it an available name. And there's a code, with, oh, thank you very much. Great, laser pointer. Uh, tiniest dot I've ever seen. <laughs> but it's a dot nonetheless. Okay, so when it comes to describing a new species, there's a code, a set of rules you have to adhere to, which is specified by the International Code of Zoological Nomenclature. And it's an enormously complicated long list uh, that you have to adhere to when you write a, uh, a find of what you think is a new species, okay? But, uh, the major uh, 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 component of, of describing a new species is publishing the name or the nomenclatural act. Okay, so you dream up a name, you have to publish it in a journal, and you also have to accompany it with a description or definition that states in words characters that are purported to differentiate the taxon from other species. So you need to uh, back up your claim that this is a new species with distinguishing characteristics, and. The guy who really got the ball rolling in uh, taxonomy is Carl Linnaeus. And it's his Systema Naturae from 1758, 10th edition, which is widely believed to represent the uh, beginning of this uh, standardized format for describing new species. And in Systema Naturae, Linnaeus actually described 10,000 species of organisms, 6,000 plants, because he was primarily a botanist, and 4,000 animals. If you look at some of Linnaeus's descriptions, they're really, really simple. So this is a beetle called Staphylinus, okay? And this, his species description of it is 12 words, all right? And there's no illustration in Systema Naturae of, of, of Staphylinus. So if, you're, if you've never seen Staphylinus and you come along and you see this kind of description, antenna necklace-like, elytra, which is the wing cases of the beetle, halved, tail simple, with two oblong, like, it's kind of hard to imagine what Staphylinus looks like. So this is Staphylinus. It's really an incredible insect. It's absolutely beautiful. It's got all of this intricate morphology that Linnaeus's description could never really convey. Yes, it's kind of got necklace-like antennae, but then so do many other insects. It's a leetra, its wing cases are, I guess, sort of halved because they're very short and they don't cover the, the abdomen like they do in most beetles. This, this, this isn't really the tail either, it's the abdomen, and it's, it's kind of subjective to call it simple. And yes, there are two oblong cells at the end. So Linnaeus's description doesn't really do Staphylinus justice. And since uh, uh, Systema Naturae is published, species descriptions have come a, a very long way. Now, Linnaeus could have uh, included illustrations of Staphylinus in his uh, Systema Naturae, because he did have a microscope. And it looks kind of primitive, but you would have been able to see quite a lot with this microscope. And it, it's widely believed that Linnaeus didn't really use his microscope very much, even though he had one. And so many of his descriptions are just uh, uh, text-based descriptions. He did occasionally do drawings, but it was normally of things that you could see with the, the naked eye. So what I'm going to discuss today is uh, how species descriptions and specimen imaging, the visualization of, of these uh, organisms in the natural world has, has evolved over the past 250 odd years since, since the steam and nature I was published. And I'm going to do it with reference to the group of beetles which are closest to my heart. These are uh, Salafine rove beetles that I've collected and studied since I was a teenager. And all of these beetles here with this incredible morphological diversity are between one and three millimeters long. They're absolutely tiny. But there's about 10,000 species of these beetles. To put that into context, there's about 10,000 species of birds. Now, there's me and about seven other people on planet Earth who study these beetles, and compare that to the number of people who study birds, 
And this probably represents maybe 5 to 10% of the total number of species of Salaphine road beetles out there. So it's fair to say this is a very poorly studied group of organisms. But they're ecologically probably very important. If you go to the tropical rainforest and see sift leaf litter and look for the beetles, these are one of the predominant groups. So they're extremely ecologically abundant and extremely uh, diverse morphologically, and there's thousands of species of them. So, just like Linnaeus, early uh, descriptions of Salaphine beetles, often just uh, word-based verbal descriptions, often in Latin. So this is uh, the Reverend King describing a beetle called Ritus from Australia. And there's a 40-word description and uh, no image. So again, if you read this description, you'd have no idea that Ritus had a head like this with this gigantic cavity inside it. And if you zoomed into the cavity, you'd see it had this huge spike of unknown function inside. So just uh, writing a few words about a species, again, is not really doing an organism like this uh, justice. And so people appreciated that verbal descriptions uh, uh, were kind of lacking. And so uh, they started to include um, they started to increase the length of these verbal descriptions and also started to include illustrations. So this is Raffray uh, writing in 1894 about a beetle called Mechanica. So now we're up to 143 words. And you can read this description. It, it does actually give quite a good picture of what this beetle looked like, but still not good enough. And so Raffray, who was actually pretty good at drawing, would start to include uh, uh, really beautiful illustrations of the beetles that beetles that he was describing. This is a, uh, a study of Salaphine road beetles from 1890, and I think it's one of my favorite images of these beetles that have come from pen and ink. And for the uh, following 100 years, uh, if you were good at drawing, you'd include images, pen and ink, often stippled or, or, or pencil uh, drawings of uh, uh, of these insects or their structures in your description. So these are some uh, uh, drawings of some beetles from um, uh, Sri Lanka by somebody who's obviously very good at drawing these beetles. Here's another couple that I really like. This is a thing called Malikula that lives in ant colonies in uh, Australia. You can see it's like a really heavily armored tank of a beetle. Um, it's presumably physically attacked by the nest, uh, the, the worker ants inside the nest. This is a thing called uh, 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 Amorops, which is a blind, cave-adapted one of these beetles. You can see it's got no eyes up here. Its body's covered in these hairs, so it walks around in constant darkness. This is one of my favorite illustrations. This is by Claude Bessichet from 1991. And he found this absolutely magnificent uh, beetle, again, from uh, uh, Sri Lanka, Cholelodion, the name of this thing is, and again, it's believed that it lives with ants. It's got this, its neck is, is formed by this tiny little sort of bridge up here, and we think that the ants come along and pick it up and grab it by, by the neck and carry it around the nest. Um, and all over its body is decorated with glandular structures that are involved in producing compounds that enable this beetle to be accepted into the life of the colony. Um, Doing these drawings, sometimes you can, rather than trying to do the most accurate drawing you can, it's quite important to distill down the morphology that you're looking at uh, to, to the most important parts that can distinguish the species. So this is the genus Metopeoxis from South America. And what's really important here are the, are the positions of these structures on the head. So these are different species of Metopeoxis, just depicting where the, where the size and shape and relative position of these different head structures. The same goes for this python aplectine from, from South America. It's the shape of this kind of inverted T-shaped head here, which is important. OK. But not everyone can draw. And that's a real problem. So you get people like Moschelsky, 1855. He's, I think he's probably trying his best here. But there's no way you can recognize what any of these beetles are from his drawings. And again, his species descriptions were just a few, few sentences. So it's really just what he was doing was admirable, but ultimately just a, a waste of time. And so the fact that um, not everyone can draw and uh, 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 the fact that you know species descriptions, verbal descriptions, don't always convey the morphology of, of the organisms you're looking at means that what you really want is a, a really good photograph of, of, of the uh, insect you're working with. 
But the problem has been, historically, that uh, cameras weren't powerful enough. And also, when you start looking at really small organisms like you know, beetles that are a couple of millimeters long, the higher the magnification of your camera, the lower the depth of field. So, for example, zooming in on this fly eye here, you can only see at any one, one point part of the uh, 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 structure being in focus. Now, and as a consequence, for the, up until maybe 15, 20 years ago, people generally didn't include photographs of the species they were describing unless they were above a certain size threshold. Um, but this has uh, really changed uh, uh, recently with the advent of montage imaging. So in montage imaging, you get your camera with a really powerful macro lens, and you take multiple images going through the z specimen's z-axis. So you start at the top and you work through the uh, 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 specimen. And then using a, a montage algorithm, you can uh, project all of these images together and filter out the parts of the image which are out of focus. So you can produce this uh, 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 montage picture where all parts of the insect are now in view. And this has really transformed species description. So if you look in the taxonomic journals now, a lot of the time you'll see these montage images and they do a really great job of, of uh, uh, depicting the morphology of often very small insects. So I'm going to show you some examples of montage imaging from uh, my own work. So this, this is a thing uh, called, this is a salapine rose beetle called Jubogaster. I named it Jubogaster. It's found in an a, a ant colony in the per Peruvian Amazon. And uh, it's a super cool insect. <laughs> it's one of my favorite, favorite salapine rove beetles. And so, but again, it's a few millimeters long. This one's five millimeters long. But with montage imaging, you can get these really beautiful uh, 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 pictures of, uh, uh, of Jubogaster. This is the dorsal and the ventral surface. These are some uh, even higher magnification pictures. I particularly like the head here. Like looking at this thing full on, it's actually a really kind of intimidating organism. So you can imagine if you were an ant and inside a colony in the Peruvian Amazon and this thing wandered up to you. It'd be kind of fantastic. So using montage imaging, you can get really cool pictures of very small organisms. And uh, kind of correlated with the advent of montage imaging, uh, uh, you can also increase the length of your uh, verbal species description. So this is my description of Jubogaster here, and it's 1,752 words. Now compare that to Linnaeus, which is just 12 words. Um, so I, I hope that like, just by reading this uh, bit of text here, if you could make it to the end, then you'd have a pretty good idea of maybe how Jubogaster looked, even without seeing the montage images. This is a, a genus called Morphogenia that I found sitting in a drawer in the Natural History Museum in London. Again, this is from the Brazilian uh, Amazon. And again, it's a, a new genus that nobody had described before. I named it Morphogenia strui after my supervisor, uh, just to kind of keep him happy. But <laughs> I was getting distracted with all those beetle uh, And again, this is a montage image of a 2.9 millimeter long beetle. And you can see in really nice detail all of the structures in the head. And the, and the body, like I found the male and also the female of this, of this species. And you can see the male's got this really large eye and the female's got a really reduced eye. The male has full flight wings, the female's got reduced flight wings and so the male probably flies, around, invests in flying around locating mates with his wings and large eyes and the female kind of just hangs out ready to get, <laughs> to, 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 to mate. <laughs> uh, these are some other montage images produced with compound microscopy of certain structures in, in Morphogenia, so like the, uh, the uh, tarsi and the uh, claws. So zooming in through the head to show these apodemes, these kind of internal bits of scaffolding inside the head. Um, these are the uh, 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 terminal segments of the abdomen, which are sex sexually dimorphic between males and females and quite good diagnostic characters. But here I've also added some drawings. This is the thorax, and this is the male genitalia. Now the male genitalia in insects is a crucial character that's often used to define species because there's runaway sexual selection which changes the uh, uh, shape of the genitalia at a much faster evolutionary rate than other parts of the body. And so often you'll find uh, beetle, beetles that look alike, 
and then you'll dissect the genitalia and you'll find that there's quite a few different species there based on the uh, morphology of this of this structure. Presumably there's a kind of lock and key mechanism there which is involved in uh, 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 speciation. So there's strong evolutionary pressure to cha change the size and shape of the male genitalia and this is reflected in the, in the uh, 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 differences between species. Now, uh, this montage imaging has uh, uh, become really popular and one of the best people uh, montage imaging is, in my mind, is this guy Nicola Rame from uh, Budapest. And what he does is he mounts his uh, fancy camera on top of a, a special stand with a microscope objective. And he's uh, taken some images of salafines, which I think are the best images ever taken. So for example, this is a thing called Euplectus, European uh, genus. And this is only just over a millimetre long. And you, you can see it with amazing detail almost all the aspects of the external morphology of this beetle. This is a zooming in on its head. And you can see again, look, this, is, you know, this is a speck of dust to the human eye, but the, with a camera and a microscope objective and montage imaging, the whole thing comes to life. This is a beetle called Salaphus. It's another nice image by, by uh, Nicola. You turn it upside down, it's got this kind of Santa beard of, of, uh, of, of flat CT on, on its chin. It's really cool. This is Rhybaxis laminatus, one, uh, uh, Euro another European species. Again, it's a really beautiful image. This is its head. Again, this is a really tiny beetle, and you're seeing it like it's exploded like this. It's absolutely fantastic. Now, uh, Nicola actually started to take images of this group of salafines, and this group of salafines are extremely special, okay, because they are ones which are only ever found inside ant colonies. They're blind, they've got no obvious eyes, their uh, wings have pretty much degenerated, the segments of the abdomen have fused together, and they're covered in glandular structures. And if you see one of these beetles inside a colony, this is one that I found the day after I got married in Austin, Texas. I think it's an, actually a new species. Rather than attack this beetle, the ants will actually walk up to it and feed it liquid food, mouth to mouth, it's oral trophallaxis. So this beetle is socially integrated inside colonies of ants and exists as a social parasite. It's not obviously benefiting the colony. In fact, the beetles will pick this, uh, the ants will pick this beetle up, carry it around the nest, not only feed it, but they'll dump it in the brood galleries where it'll pierce open ant eggs and suck out the inside. So it's this amazing uh, co co colony parasite. This is another uh, image from Nicola where he zoomed in on the mouth parts. And you can see rather than having a standard like the raptorial mandibles that uh, most predatory uh, uh, beetles have. This whole head is sort of turned into a str straw whereby it can receive liquid food regurgitated by the ants. There are mandibles in here. They, they can extend just outside of the oral cavity a tiny amount, of just, just enough to pierce open the ant eggs and suck out the, the insides. And so while uh, Nicola was taking these images of, these, of this group, they're called clavigerines, uh, me and uh, the curator of uh, fossil insects in the American Museum of Natural History found a 52 million year old version of one of these beetles in uh, Cambay Amber from India. So this is the earliest example of this kind of uh, 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 lifestyle known in, in uh, animals as form of biological social parasitism. And this is actually from a, an amber deposit early Eocene amber deposit that marks the first appearance in the fossil record of a significant fraction of modern ants. So right at the beginning of modern ants, which we kind of accept uh, today as being this kind of dominant group of arthropods, these beetles were wandering inside their nests and usurping resources and basically being these un un unwelcome uh, guests. Uh, there was one news outlet that referred to this, this beetle as the primordial moocher, which I really like. So. Uh, Nicola took a really cool picture of one of these uh, living species. This is Clavigia longicornis, European species. And uh, we managed to get it onto the cover of the uh, journal Current Biology when we published this fossil species, which is super cool. Now, you might have noticed these beetles, there's many different kinds, they've all got these yellow brush like structures on their bodies. These are called trichomes. And if you see these 
beetles inside ant colonies, you'll see the ants wander up to this part of the body and they'll start licking it. And these uh, uh, trichomes are kind of like candle wicks which conduct compounds from glands that are embedded at the base of the abdomen. And what these compounds do is they behaviorally manipulate ants. So ants will walk up to them, they find this stuff really attractive and it overcomes the natural aggression of the ants and causes them to adopt these beetles inside the colony. And so one uh, uh, line of work that I'm really interested in is exploring, the, uh, exploring these tr trichomes and the gla these glands and the compounds that produce them. And one of the techniques that I've developed, which I've started to apply generally to visualizing somatophines, is this confocal microscopy. Now in confocal microscopy, you blast your sample with a laser and the light that bounces off is collected through a confocal aperture, which just collects uh, 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 light at a specific uh, point along the Z plane of the specimen. So you can go through the specimen through, uh, uh, in, in sections, collecting these confocal images, and then assemble them down into a, what looks like a 3D uh, uh, projection. And so when you uh, uh, use confocal microscopy to visualize the trichomes, rather than just seeing this kind of bunch of hairs, a collection of hairs, like you would in a standard montage image, you can see in real detail the, how, they, how they're formed, where they're attached, various other aspects of the uh, 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 cuticle of these insects. And I'm not staining this structure with anything, it's just the standard autofluorescence, the, sh the shininess of this cuticle, uh, uh, which is uh, reflected light. Now, I'll just show you a few ex more examples of using confocal microscopy. This is a thing called, a uh, genus called Homotus. This is a new species, again, from an ant colony in Peru, a leafcutter ant colony. This is an undescribed species that uh, me and my friends plan to name after my wife. She's awesome. Uh, and uh, this, uh, this is some confocal uh, images of different parts of uh, the uh, uh, body of this species of Homotus. So you can see the head here, the head in profile, the uh, maxillary palps, the mandibles. This is the antenna here. And with confocal microscopy, you can zoom in really close. And you can see that the male uh, tenth antenna has this excavation inside it, which the female doesn't. So presumably performing some unknown uh, role in sex-specific behaviors. These are other parts of the body of Homotus. It's covered in these awesome hairs. Um, and uh, I, I've started to use this confocal technique pretty much as standard in my work on salaphines. And it's the most striking when you're visualizing the heads of these uh, insects. So this is Cacoplectus, a thing from Panama. You can see almost cartoon-like head, which is revealed when you blast it with uh, the, the uh, laser under the confocal microscope. Uh, this is another cave adapted uh, genus called Macarites from Europe. Again, it's blind and it's got these gigantic maxillary palps that it probably uses to feel its way around, a, around in the darkness inside caves. This is a thing called Tenosodes. Again, lives in ant colonies, but you can find this uh, genus in upstate New York. Uh, don't really know too much about its biology, but again, it's got these incredible maxillary palps don't really know what it's doing with them, but we think maybe it's uh, interacting with ants and potentially being fed by the ants. Um, this is a, a, a genus called Pacacuti from Ecuador. This is one of the earliest images I took using the confocal microscope. And I was encouraged to submit this to uh, uh, one of these digital imaging contests. And it, this picture was a finalist at the Olympi Olympus Bioscapes uh, competition in 2014. Here's another one I sent into a competition. I take these images for other purposes, and then, you know, it's quite easy to email them to one of these competitions, and a couple of them have done quite well. So this is Tycho Bythonus, the thing that you find, again, in upstate New York. It's not obviously associated with ants, this guy, uh, but this one uh, was a finalist in the Nikon Small World contest. A bit of showing off there, sorry. Okay, so, back to Amber. Now, Amber's, like, Amber's amazing. It's this kind of medium that's tracked insect life millions of years and you can see these things sitting inside amber as if they're still alive they're kind of just in suspended an animation um, these are 100 million year old uh, salaphines in mid-cretaceous amber from uh, Myanmar and you can 
it's the same way you do with a normal specimen. You can take a photograph and make a montage image and reveal most of the morphology in this amazing resolution, as long as you polish the amber and you know it's a clean amber piece. And often amber specimens are quite dark. So this is a thing that we believe lived inside termite colony, the earliest termite colonies are hundreds. Um, million years ago and no matter how much light you shine on this thing there's always a part of it which is super dark so I tried the confocal technique on the uh, on this specimen and it worked really well to reveal the ventral morphology of, of this uh, 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 species and all of these uh, modifications to the head and the antennae which we think are involved in uh, adjusting this beetle to life inside termite colonies this is some pictures of the head so he's got this really mean looking head with this scissor-like mandibles, yeah, super cool. They stick out thick, reinforced antennae, which are probably uh, adaptations to, to colony life. And then, in some cases, amber is extremely opaque. So this is a Cretaceous French amber. Again, it's about 100 million years old, and you can't see through it. So it's really problematic to work with. But some people in France have used extremely high-powered X-rays to uh, uh, see through this uh, 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 material. And you can start to pick out insects that are inside it. And uh, with a lot of work, you can actually reveal them with amazing resolution. So this is this uh, x-ray computed uh, t t tomography of a, of a beetle related to the salafines I work with in this opaque amber from 100 million years ago. And you know, it, it's absolutely incredible, the, the level of detail that you can see. There's a lot of work involved in taking these sections from different, x-raying the uh, amber from different angles, uh, accumulating these sections and reconstructing them into a, a 3D uh, beetle like this. So this is a new genus and species from uh, uh, David Paris and Margaret Thayer at the Field Museum in Chicago. Um, here's another example, really recently published, of a beetle, which was uh, 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 a beetle fossil, uh, a rock fossil, okay? So I couldn't actually find an image of the fossil itself, but it's a beetle that looks like this, kind of embedded like a standard fossil in, in rock, and using this uh, X-ray computer tomography and taking these sections through the beetle, it's amazing. You could actually see all of these uh, ex external morphology and even go inside the beetle and see aspects of the tracheal system, the digestive tract, all of this internal morphology, the anatomy of the beetle is perfectly preserved. This is 20 to 40 million years old. Um, and all importantly, the, the uh, uh, male genitalia are, are perfectly preserved and could be reconstructed using this technique. And this beetle could be placed into the uh, evolutionary tree of the g genus that it, uh, it belongs to based on all, all of the morphological attributes that you can see using this technique which wouldn't otherwise be visible. Okay, so I just want to close now by uh, discussing uh, insect images in the uh, online age that we uh, currently fi find ourselves in. Now, historically it's been difficult to study in the, many of these insects because they're, found, they're, they're deposited in museums worldwide and you either have to get a loan of these specimens sent to you and some museums are notoriously difficult about sending out loans or you'd have to visit the museum yourself. So if you have a new species of beetle that you, or you think you have a new species of beetle but it's, you think maybe it's closely related to this other one, you really need to see the type specimen of that other, other uh, beetle species was just the reference point for the other species to compare your one to that previously described one and note any differences which might justify your decision that it's a new, new species. And so taxonomy, one of the kind of rate limiting steps in, in documenting life on earth through this process of species descriptions is accessing all of the specimens in these museums. And there's a big movement now in muse museums worldwide to kind of digitize images of these specimens to make them available online so that entomologists in the diff different parts of the world can dip into these collections and ex explore uh, their, their uh, inventories. So this is, uh, this is a Flickr account which the Natural History Museum in London, the Beatles section of the Natural History Museum in London have set up. 
and they have all of these historically important specimens. Remember, that these are type specimens that have a red label, so these are the reference specimens for the species which you have to uh, consult if you want to describe a, what you think is a closely related species. Uh, just to give an example of it's a real treasure trove of images that they've, they've put online with uh, so many beautiful specimens. This is a, a, a beetle that was collected by Charles Darwin uh, in Argentina that was only described a couple of years ago. It's a thing called Darwinilus sedasi, described by Stelios catamanolis. And uh, uh, the Natural History Museum in London have made all of these brilliant images of it available online. And there are specimens there, not only from Darwin, but Alfred Russell Wallace and other l luminaries in the field. It's such a historically important collection, and they're making it all available online. Other museums are using uh, novel approaches, such as the Gigapan, which you can take a whole drawer of specimens and take an extremely high resolution image that you can then zoom into individual specimens and see, uh, see their uh, uh, bo bo body structures. This is still in the kind of early stages of, of development, and I think it's maybe quite, quite expensive. But there are all of these attempts to address this uh, uh, impediment uh, caused by having these things in drawers in cabinets in museums and not readily available to, to uh, people who want to study them by putting these images of them online. One of the other problems has been access to his historical literature. So often species descriptions are buried in some book which is out of print from 200 years ago. It's very difficult to get hold of unless you're, again, associated or working at a museum with an amazing library. And so a few years ago, uh, this Biodiversity Heritage Library was uh, set up, which uh, is scanning huge amounts of this literature, which is no longer under copyright, and, and making it available online. So there are an inordinate amount of important uh, uh, scientific works that can be accessed through the Biodiversity Heritage Library, which wouldn't otherwise be readily available. So for someone like me, who's not you know, always around a museum, or if I find myself away from a museum and I need a, uh, a piece of literature, often I can find it in Biodiversity Heritage Library. It's not, not everything is there, but a huge amount of stuff, and it's growing. You notice that uh, the Biodiversity Heritage Library itself has a Flickr stream, and somebody there is obviously extracting beautiful images from all of these old uh, 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 taxonomic and natural history works and making them available online. So I really urge you to go and check out the uh, Biodiversity Heritage Library Flickr stream. There's really absolutely uh, am amazing images of, of uh, uh, historically important uh, uh, pieces of, of literature that, uh, that they've made, they've made, made available. Okay, and I just want to finish by uh, uh, plugging my own efforts to kind of uh, bring the beetles that I work with into the dig digital realm. So I set up a Salafini Facebook page, which is dedicated to the study of uh, the uh, beetles that I work with. And you can find all sorts of amazing images that me and other people who are interested in these beetles have taken. Uh, references to literature and uh, new studies and like a large amount of discussion about the biology of these beetles and also occasionally uh, an April Fool. So this is, this is a ten-legged specimen supposedly from Malaysia that feeds on millipedes. <laughs> I'll stop there and take any questions. Thank you. Yes. So my favorite technique has got to be the confocal stuff, because I, I felt like, hold on, let me get back to a couple of these. As soon as I put these beetles underneath the confocal microscope, I saw them in a new way, with a new uh, 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 a level of detail that I'd never really encountered them before. And it was almost like getting to know them again. So 
there was, you know, I've collected these things since I was 16 years old, and it was only a few years ago that I started to do this, and it was, it was a, like, you know, a revolution in my head, and so I, I really like, I, 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 I love this technique. Well, I, I, could, I couldn't hear your other question. Oh, motion, like how they move? Yeah, like video. Oh, yes. So, huh, that's a very interesting point. I think there's a, I think that there is to some extent, and there really should be more of an effort not to just document the morphology of these insects, but also their behavior. Okay, so ultimately these specimens have to be taken from the wild and put inside into museums where they're dead. But before that's done, if some aspects of their behavior, the way they move, the way they behave, maybe what they feed on are documented, that just increases the richness of this discipline, you know, uh, 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 su su substantially. So, and it's, these are also diagnostic characters, so different species have different behaviors, and uh, 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 as you say, like, the way they move, all of these kinds of things are different and potentially taxonomically very informative. I think recently there was an example of a, a frog which was found on Staten Island, which looked like a frog that you find right across the East Coast, but it's got a different call. And that led some uh, herpetologists to try and explore whether this represented a new species. And so they sequenced this DNA, and it turns out it was definitely a new species. And they wouldn't have been able to do that had they not you know, tuned into this aspect of this biology. And you could imagine any aspect of the way something behaves or acts could be informative in that regard. Yes? Uh, have you seen any efforts to use uh, artificial intelligence and image recognition Yes, yeah, definitely. There's all these kind of machine learning approaches where computers are presented with images of this is this was there was a uh, group working on this at the museum, uh, looking at images of I think jumping spider or some kind of spider's eyes, which are kind of diagnostic of and and, and uh, seeing if the computer could partition them into different groups, which. You know, biologists would recognize the species. So I would say, yes, yes, there is. Uh, uh, it's not at the stage where it's any kind of substitute for the skilled taxonomist, but yeah, in the future, like, like I said, you know, the fraction of life on Earth that we have just described so far may be quite small. And maybe if there was some kind of high throughput way of documenting it, that would be fantastic. But I still think. It's going to be a while before there's any substitute for the kind of trained eye of the taxonomist. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. That was great.